for wearing a mask while we're inside here, unless you're speaking, fellows at the podium, and then please take your mask off. Diego, are we ready to begin? We're okay. All right. Um, the loop of images that you see here are now from two years ago. You all remember that we were closed all of last year because of COVID. And I, I'm just amazed we're open this year and did four full groups without any incidents. Well, this group is still here. We don't know how, how things will go. But uh, we keep talking about that wonderful, this is, of course, the 700th year of Dante's death. And we keep talking about that wonderful quote from the Inferno where they come out of the darkness and see the stars. And that's very much how we feel after a very difficult year last year to finally be out and seeing the stars again. So even though these are from two years ago, we wanted this loop to run so that you could um, remember some of the great talent that we had. Uh, Diego was saying he feels that we'll always talk about before 2020 and after 2020. So next I want to show you the map of um, where our fellows come from. It's been updated to include the fellows from this group. Here it is. Um, those of you who have been coming to Chibitel over these last 25 years, I hope you can see that the greens keep getting darker and darker all over the world as we expand the number of fellows for different nations. As I mentioned last time, all of you in the public can help us with this. If you read an interesting article about an artist, a writer, or a composer in one of these countries, especially that have um, the gray areas where we just have had one or two fellows, um, send the article along to me. It's one of the ways that we do research courses online. So we're grateful to you all for doing that. Before we get underway, I just want to thank um, the staff, Diego, Ilaria, Juliet, Greta, and I thought I saw Angelo was going to be here. I don't know if she is. OK. Um, but thank you all. They are the ones who've really helped us manage the ever-changing information that comes to us this year uh, and helps us to, to work. So for our fellows, I think some of you know the way this works because other institutions do this as well. You have five minutes um, to tell us everything you know. Um, and if you exceed five minutes, Ilaria rings the dawn. Um, we used to use Diego's cell phone, but it was too subtle. So um, we're, we're hoping you'll do that. Um, and I thank you all, fellows, for participating tonight. It really reminds us um, why we do what we do to have you all here. So without further ado, is there anything else I was supposed to announce? OK, we're ready to go. And first, uh, with a double A initial, Anuk Arud Pradasam, a uh, fellow from Sri Lanka. Hi, everyone. It's so lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to read to you from something uh, from a novel in progress. Uh, that is very different from the stuff that I've written so far because it's not set in Sri Lanka. Um, and I only have a little bit over five minutes, so I'm just going to start. Navini had been making her way through the brisk January evening, her ungloved hands stuck into the pockets of her jeans, her shoulders hunched, her muscles caught, her gaze directed to the slabs of pavement passing monotonously beneath her feet. When drawn by the play of light and shadow on the sidewalk ahead, she raised her eyes and saw, radiating light under the desolation of the road, the scratched glass facade of the neighborhood boxing gym. She'd been living in Sunnyside since the end of summer, but had noticed the gym for the first time just a few weeks before. Its dingy signage and aura of disrepair made it hard to distinguish from all the delis, dollar stores, laundromats, and liquor stores in the area around the station. Just one more relic in a neighborhood that only recently began succumbing to the forces of real estate. 
She stopped to glance inside that afternoon, the weather-worn fight posters on the door bringing to mind her own long past in the sport. But there had been something depressing about the gym's lightless interior and she'd continued on her way, forgetting about the place soon after and scarcely registering its presence, perhaps intentionally, on any of her subsequent walks. Tonight, for some reason, the atmosphere seemed far more vibrant, the lively thrum of hip-hop issuing out of the street from beneath the plexiglass door. And approaching the gym, Nami couldn't help slowing down to stare at the brightly lit figures inside, the three older, light-skinned men playing cards at a table near the entrance, Latino they seemed, the lean young boys and men moving around behind them, running on treadmills, wrapping their hands and shadow boxing in the ring, a multitude of shades from beige to brown to black. It was only at night the boxing gyms came really alive, Nami remembered as she gazed inside. It was only at night that all the amateurs and aspiring pros in working class neighborhoods were free to abandon their daytime identities as electricians, plumbers and construction workers. They gather inside the familiar confines of the gym and devote themselves to their craft till closing time demand demanded their return to small homes and mechanized lives. Though emotionally, of course, most of them never really left the gym, Nabonino. Continuing over the course of the next day's work, the mentally rehearsed their complex repertoires of advance and retreat, their painfully acquired patterns of threat and punishment, visualizing all the possible scenarios that could arise in the ring and how they might respond till the working day at last ended and they were free once more to toil in that intimate space of fantasy and dream. She was already a little late for a meeting with Kadir in the city, already a little guilty for having cancelled their previous day's plans. But gazing in through the gym's glass fronting, Nami remained transfixed by the scene before her, conscious of her awkwardness as she stood there alone on the sidewalk, reassured at the same time that no one inside seemed to notice her, that there was no one on the street to watch her watching them. She gazed at three boxers in the ring as they moved to and fro and side to side, dissecting the air in vigorous combinations, slipping to the right to avoid invisible jabs, raising their hands to their cheeks to protect from imagined hooks. Watched as they moved their strong bodies in distinct but synchronized rhythms, fully immersed in themselves but managing somehow to ma maintain perfect distance between themselves as they exchanged places around the ring. She could hear neither their controlled grunts nor their exhalations as they punched and moved, punched and moved, and because perhaps the insistent beat of the music echoing softly into the otherwise silent street, it seemed like a large elevated ring, brightly lit and surrounded by mirrors, was meant as a kind of platform or stage. The movements of the boxers not, not so much a rehearsal for combat as a kind of partly improvised, partly choreographed dance. It had been 12 years since Nabani had stepped inside a boxing gym, 12 years since she'd given up her ambitions in the sport at the age of 16, and she thought as she looked inside now how long it had been since she'd given her body up to that strict geometry of instinct and habit, how long it had been since she'd inhabited a space of such simultaneously individual and collective endeavor, how long since she'd been driven by the vision of a compelling future self. It had been 12 years since she managed to leave Toronto, since she'd escaped the desolate grey section of the city she'd grown up in with her mother and sister, and perhaps because some resistance had prevented her from reflecting on that time since then, perhaps because boxing simply had no meaning in the different, seemingly more civilized world to which she now, to which she now belonged, governed as it was by gentler ways of negotiating the boundaries between selves. It seemed to her as she gazed inside that she was seeing her own former life through the glass, remembering after many years one of her own former selves. It was as though, after the conversation with her mother that afternoon, she had need now to recollect this older, more assertive part of herself, to give it new space inside her. And standing in front of the gym, she felt an urge to walk up and push open the plexiglass door, to step out of the sharp, co to step out of the sharp cold of the street and enter that space of overwhelming intimacy. Let us be assailed by the hip hop blaring from the speakers and the humidity of the room, the perspiration of straining male bodies and the pungency of bed and sweat. She remained there unmoving for how long she didn't know, till shivering quietly she realized that she wasn't really inside, that her muscles, clenched till then against the chill, had loosened and relaxed, rendering her susceptible to the cold. The shivering brought her brief transport to an end, reminded her to tense her body and trust her hands more deeply inside her pockets that she was late for a meeting with Khaled and had to hurry if she wanted to be on time. The turning and resuming her way to the station, watching as the pavement began passing underfoot once more in the dark of the street, she couldn't relinquish the strange, almost prophetic feeling of separate times and places collapsing into one, an unusually keen, almost muscular contemplation of here and there, then and now.
Catherine Bach is a fellow in music composition from the United States. Hi, um, I'm going to play a piece of music performed by my friend Stephanie Lampreya. Um, and this is a piece um, for soprano, crystal glasses, and gravel. And a feature in a lot of my music is um, found sounds or found objects, um, usually offering sort of some sort of sonic diary into where I am, or you know, either geographically or personally. But and in this case, I wrote this piece while I was in Colorado and spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, the text is a black eyed poetry exercise I made from um, uh, W.M. or E.M. Forster's essay. Um,
And next is Daniel Bjarnason, who is a composer from Iceland.
Next is Mary Carlson. She's a visual artist from New York. is a
India, I think I've seen her like three in my life. She was more popular in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, but that's a lion um, on her arm, fighting her arm. Um, then I discovered she had a <laughs> Serenity Chapel and all those little demons in there. Turn of Stanislaus. Now that the corn is up and the hay is down, or that the hay is up and the corn is down, now that the sides have been touched up, have been oiled lightly and hung in the rafters, now that bucolic wonder has washed across the valley, has flowed like champagne light into every nook known. Now that the wheat has been separated from the chaff, never again one to intermingle with the other, and the pheasant has been shot on the run, or even if it wasn't running, and plucked of every feather on the trail in the dust, and hung then from the pommel for any traveler to see. Now that the horses have been greased and carefully parked under waxed tarps, where they will wait in beige box stalls for oats and maybe apples. Now that night has fallen, now that the comet can be seen in the sky but probably won't be, and the smell of baked bread is moving through castle corridors, and the feeling the foot might have as it passes up out from a stocking is not entirely out of the question. Now that candles are lit, that mice are on the move, that dried blood has marked the stoop. 
It is now that I bend down to lift the little one into position. Now that day's been done, now that day's been on the run and ran, and out from shadow steps my stand. Uh, I'll just read one more, and this one, and I thought it'd be fun to read something really new. I wrote this yesterday, so maybe it's a dangerous move. <clears throat> it was too late. He was already galloping down the road toward Dresden, his hat and jacket densely covered with dusty wings. The recent rainstorm had the marsh winds talking, shifting foot to foot, the roadside ditches lined with carpets of knot grass. Rain wet cobblestones glinted, hoofbeats clopped and slid, smoked witch balls hung in nearly every cottage window. And beneath all this, his bib was stained. Spilled port and maybe pudding? The port in particular left its roar shock of Africa. Something had called him and he was responding. Like a taxi driver with a load of bone china. Like Odo of Clooney scooching sideways toward Dadina. He closed his eyes. His horse did not notice. And saw... Seaside slot machines, a bowl of candle nuts on a nightstand, an endless tail unfolding scarf like over a sea of apple trees. The flute player's wax fingernails drummed unrhythmically. Who was she? He jiggled the reins a bit. He perked up. He was near now and loped along a stone canal. He saw a colony of white ants floating on a stale loaf of rye. He saw an ornate sign announcing the worshipful company of Langer. A previously hidden motorboat now seemed to be following him. The morning light hitting water looked almost deep straw yellow. The drunk man threw perfect cleat hitches despite peeing his pants. Also church bells heard at intervals, and noodle vendors down from noodle towers, the very same noodle towers he had often dreamt of. Thank you. And next are latest arrival, Camelia Ibran, who is a fellow in music. She was raised in a Palestinian village in uh, Galilee, but now she lives in France. Thank you, Donna. Hello, everybody. Um, I will not um, perform, I will not sing, but usually I sing and I play an instrument called oud and I compose uh, the things that I sing. Uh, but I found that uh, this moment of just uh, talking to the people I'm in front of, it's just a precious moment, uh, knowing that the music I do it could be found in a way or another, <laughs> thanks to internet today, of course. Um, as Dana, you said, uh, yes, I'm born in the Galilee. Uh, to parents who love music and who didn't have really uh, much as children to learn, neither to educate themselves, they survived a war in 1948 and they practiced music at home. And I grew up in this ambience. Uh, and I learned that uh, music is something that we need to do every day. It's like food. And this is what helped me be here today because um, I learned so many values from their uh, resistance to a lot of challenges in their lives. And they told me that if you wish to do something, you can do it. Just uh, think of it and make it. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, in this uh, wonderful place. And I'm very uh, lucky to have the chance to come and have some time out uh, to think about what uh, 
I do in my life and what I look for to continue to do, those moments are precious. I don't have them every day. Uh, I had such a, a moment in 2002, uh, living in uh, Switzerland for two months, uh, thanks to a residency program offered by Privatia. It's an organization that promotes a cultural exchange between Switzerland and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and for me, uh, this residency helped me to a little bit start or to, to open a new, or to discover or to work on discovering new lands where I would like my song to go. Uh, after having uh, worked with a group in Palestine for 20 years, taking part in the music that we together um, wrote. Uh, I thought that uh, there are still many things to do. Uh, I thought that long-term relationship and long-term projects is something that is very much needed in Arab societies, especially in Palestine where we don't have really a country, but there is a history and there is people who live there and who think and uh, who wish to do things. And I think uh, that accumulation in, in, in work is very important for any civilization or any people who wish to live and continue and share uh, their products with the world. Uh, I'm in Europe since 2002, in France since 2003. I don't make mm, a lot of projects, I'm very many minister, but I have two long-term partners. Uh, Werner Hasler from Switzerland, with whom I still work since 2002, because I met him in Bern. He plays trumpet and electronic music. I met Sara Mercia, she's a double bass player from Paris in 98, and till then we work together. And what I do with those two wonderful artists, and plus other artists that I was of course happy to collaborate with, is to try to find myself to try to enrich my language and see how I sound to the others and how I can talk to the other and all the time be myself and have some adventures to do and some walls to break and some new territories to discover. Thank you. And next is visual artist Ali Kazma, who is from Turkey. Hi. Hello. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I'm going to start with I'm a video artist. I uh, make videos and sometimes photographs and books and other things, but mostly videos. I'm going to start with my shortest video and then in the time I have left I will talk a little bit more about what I do. Thank you. 
20 years I've been uh, making, uh, sorry for being a little bit pretentious, but a kind of a poetic archive of the world as I see it and as I live it. I go to different places, factories, uh, seed vaults, prisons, uh, hospitals. I go to artist studios, I go to dance studios, I go to theater, I work with theater groups. And I spend time with them. I try to understand what it is that they are doing and how it connects to the world we live in. How we make the world. And of course also artists too. I spend a lot of time with artists as well. And when I feel I have enough material of shooting with them, I make short videos. I have about 70 of them now, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and then I show them not in cinemas, but in museums and art institutions. And um, there, there are many reasons for it, but one of the most essential reasons is I see all my work as part of a bigger whole. Like they, they keep getting bigger, they talk to one another, and I want to show them in situations where there is a dialogue between them, where I can make different paragraphs, different essays with the works that I have and when I have another one I can see how it fits in with the other ones and at this moment I'm always asked how I show my works if I have a little bit of time I will show some uh, photographs from some of my exhibitions because a lot of video art is not so uh, common so people are usually quite to show you. This is from an exhibition I did in, in Paris, Dreux-Pont. Same exhibition. Uh, this is from a smaller space. I, as you can see, I can use different types of presentations, screens, or uh, uh, projection, different sizes too. I like to have this different rhythms and variations in size and sound and all of that, I think it creates a more meaningful uh, communication sometimes. The work you have just seen is in the background, you, you can see. This is from a, a museum in uh, Istanbul. This is again from Jude Pong in Paris. Same. Okay. Uh, and this is from Italy, from Venice, by any, so I wanted to show that just. <laughs> Thank you. Um, most of you know we have a long history of affiliated fellowships. And next is Diane Mehta, who is a poet, and she is our Kirby Newshaw Fellow this year. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you all for coming. I will read three poems. I timed them. It is four minutes and 45 seconds. So one is a poem I wrote last year. Uh, one is a poem I wrote in the past week, and the third is a poem that I started in New York and I finished here. I will read that one first because it includes a quote from Dante from Paradiso, uh, from a translation. It doesn't exist because I have a friend just translating Canticles. It's based on a Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins poem called That Nature is a Heraclitian Fire and the Comfort of, of the Resurrection. My title is That Nature is Fruit Flesh and the Comfort of Shouting. Each of us turns older by a page or two in the annual obsession of leaf taking, leaf shaken into new years, repeating this is the oldest age of the newest eternity, praying again. Here it is a little longer, at least as long as a year yawns on in a stretch, buttoning up against the wind, bearing down 
Wretched yarns, not silk spun enough to satisfy the heart's obsession, but a soul which loves you not, as next and next, but as remembrance. Strange tales, madness disguised as love, and love as madness, grief as this blood song fire crowned earth. Our ransacked moments of sheltering never were foundational in ways of getting into. A child's staccato, staccato stuttering vowels released spontaneously outside. No sense of second-rate time settling forward and prisms left behind. Long summer is rounded now. Heartbeat days offer greater or less succulence. The mind ripens briefly. Our hands are harvest. But earth's fruit, historical and wild, despite our best in, is despite our best inventions. Flesh. Isn't it true, as Auden said, the gates of every mind Swing to, swing shut in paradisical becoming. Laborious soul to untether those we love so much. We shed our ever discontented joys. Naked we shed everything but stars and love. In becoming we see our own recalibrating likeness. Strike free. Don't follow me. Turn back. What dazzle shine dimensioning itself inside me. Oh, what strength I lack to stare straight at the sun. To bear the ripening of the lime, musky harvest in a shortening light. Wheels of science pretending to be divine. Did we think we would discover a revolution? Do we see the stairs descending as we climb? Gallon noise. One. All morning, the off tune, brimful singing, Raki, Scritchi, Kripa, Apu, Zara. Lines a ruckus over the dream of a collective tempo. And for a fraction of a second, we hear the affections of a world in the mind. You think the sounds were from another century, knowledge so clearly carried through them. They resemble the embodied voices of mycelium sending instructions about. Morse code for roots distributing seminal beliefs as if they were explaining the scriptures of priesthood, or the water table for static speech saccadas waiting their stage appearance every 12 years. If only we, like all creatures, were untroubled by catastrophe and allowed the soil to extract from our marrow bone bodies words that disappoint and words that lie. Two. Every day at noon, the crystal mist burns off high up by the campanile. Lackadaisical day, sensational ways to feel its greens and deeper greens. But the warbling hoot and hiss serenades we hear convulse with something sinister we share, that inner rambling shrieking on the sun glowed slopes. What spirit noise this time permits? What ordinary pain and ordinary tenderness, after all, remain memory and memorial by singing and by sound. Plunkate. I'd make a plunkate when she died. Lamentation, brief faith, cottage through blood recipe, all of its colors shrieking at me, a sweet take on the love. I gaze at the street. Tree branches out front are tangled. My floor is slanted. My house cage is so small and dark for all the summits, slopes, and swamps of feeling. I am not to be purple plum decided in any still life of grief or reminiscence. No way for life, religious feeling, never. She will never be human again. I knew I wouldn't make it. Italian plums are sweetest. I should find them in the market when days are longer. Fruit of aging, gift of goodness. A friend who lost a friend and me said plum six times in one paragraph. So full of yearning are our phrases. Snow bright is her hair on the bed. Knobby knuckle skin folded on her chest. She'd be delighted to celebrate her death. I love that, she'd say happily about the plum cake wake. Plums pooled around the cake slab in the photograph, bloody and marvelous. Skylight took her in. I couldn't think. Thank you. And next is um, our second architecture fellow, Katie Newell. This again is an affiliated fellowship um, 
from William O'Brien Jr., uh, who was a fellow of ours who sponsors an architect to come. And in six weeks, Katie must conceive of, construct, and deconstruct some kind of structure. So Katie, welcome. I'm so grateful to be here and also extremely grateful to Liam O'Brien for this architecture prize that allows me to create something. Um, I'm an architect. I think one of my favorite occupants, or two of my favorite occupants, is light and darkness. And a lot of the work that I do is actually chasing uh, those elements within our spaces and seeing how they actually remake the way that we interpret them or tell their stories the way that we see them or their materials. And so the work that I do along with um, members of my firm, Alibi Studio, is often something that's very delicate. It's usually materials that are reworked in a manner um, that's trying to catch the sort of ephemeral uh, and fleeting aspects of both darkness and light, sometimes, sometimes literally carrying those or hosting them, and other times having something that's maybe even different by day or by night. Oftentimes we're working with changing existing spaces, um, finding them many times at moments of transition. I'm gonna share a couple of works um, just to get a little deeper into that. Uh, this is one of our, our works called Salvage Landscape, which in essence is really the sort of careful tending and caring to uh, an arson house as it's getting demolished slowly by hand. And so this was our this was our site, and this is our palette, and the work was slowly and carefully actually tending to this now very charred and bulbous material, um, and sorting through the wood that was once a house, leaving leaving the house there on the left as a sort of perfect kind of section cut, in which case it became actually the formwork to place the material back inside. And so very carefully the work was cut, allowing the raw work, the raw wood that still existed to be loaded back into the house, creating a new room that could not have been there without the criminal act of the fire. And if you go through this passageway and around to the other side, what you end up seeing is the cantilever of the very um, precious sort of charred wood that in their lightness of having been burnt are able to make these very long extents that are now adding, of course, a great darkness back into that space. And as the, as the house became demolished around it, what was left then is this very dense core is literally made of the back half of the house and sort of the heart of what was there in the wood um, that once constructed the house but is no longer uh, no longer a residence. And this sort of ghosting or removal of a space also came through in one of the projects called Second Story, which was um, and is the casting of a historic funeral home in Flint, Michigan, uh, that was under its own threat of demolishing. And so the work was to literally um, capture and sort of cloak or, or make the, the kind of um, cast of a portion of the exterior and the interior using a translucent acrylic so that it wasn't the texture of the material or the original work that was coming, but instead was actually the sort of ghost in the fat and the, the character that would come through and literally transporting this to a new space and in essence acting as, enacting its demolition and allowing now the sort of form and atmosphere that was there to make new spaces um, that they themselves would eventually disappear from as well. And I think a lot of our work is also always looking at kind of recognizable architectural features that then in a different moment become something um, that you can no longer see from a, from a certain vantage point. I also have a great love um, because of the interest in light and darkness and the material of glass. And so that's often used a lot in reflection, um, in form making, but also in using things with certain colors or geometries that occur just because of the form or the detail. And the last piece that I'll quickly show is, uh, is a work that we recently completed called Secret Sky, which for us was the kind of way to move these very delicate works to something the size of an entire building. So in rural Michigan, uh, I put a slice through a barn, but a slice is not just simply a cut, but instead makes this passageway um, created from the siding of other barns nearby that literally, that literally uh, moves through the space and wraps the walls around it. So this passageway, it lets you cut through the barn, but you can never get inside of it. And it's cut and open so that now actually its major occupant is, of course, the sky. Um, and so as a gift to the sky, here you see the moon coming through it. And in this case, you see the sort of the horizon and the work that is passed forward. So the work that I've been doing here, I've 
been, um, I've already been chasing the light in the darkness around the castle, um, trying to transport it and move it in different directions, and have been also um, eyeing the moon and all the light that it's reflecting, of course, from its breath. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, Bobby Oliver is next. She is the director's guest at Visual Artist from New York.
go off and make it look like something else. Um, so I always had a feeling that abstraction was something that meant something very deeply to me. I paint the paintings in a single color first, and then I look at it thinking that I know exactly what I'm going to do. And when I when I start mixing colors to go with that color, uh, I, I realize I don't know what uh, my plan is at all. And then it starts to take on a more interesting journey because then one realizes that the painting already has its own personality. And that it's a question of addressing that and instead of um, trying to impose so many rules and restrictions. So then starts the, the long story of how to deal with this out of control creature that this combination of trying to control it and, and appreciating the lack of control that one has Next is Bahar Sabzavari, sorry, Sabzavari, who is a visual artist from Iran and the USA. Bahar. of ignoring science and truth about climate change, for example. 
Um, so in in the UC result drawings, um, I depict myself as an Asiatic cheetah. Um, these Asiatic cheetahs are critically endangered and survive today only in Iran. The habitat for many of them is around the city and region where I was born. Animals have always been used in stories as metaphors for human feelings and experiences. I'm using metaphor to refer to the shyness or introversion of a cheetah by making a comparison between me and a cheetah uh, without stating so directly. The metaphor works to humor. My cheetah drawings are a nod to the role of climate change in putting at risk an already endangered community. They also nod to uh, the fragility of our human bodies and emotions. But equally important is the concept of resilience or toughness. We, like cheetahs, are social animals that have been shot into new circumstances like COVID. Sometimes in the drawings that reflect on society in a specific ways, I also just want to talk about my feelings. Um, I'm friendly like a cheetah, but below the surface, I'm an introvert. Uh, by drawing cheetahs in twisted shapes, I allow the shape, light, shadow, and body movements to express our very human vulnerability, fragility, resilience, and flexibility in managing our lives. But it is important that I show our impact on other species on Earth. Uh, I hope my works, whether they are self-portraits, close-ups of body parts or animals, trigger an emotional response in the viewer, as well as a skeptical um, response in the subject matter. Thank you so much. Francis Marie Buiti, who is a composer and musician from the Netherlands. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to be here uh, and not a little intimidated by this company that is just extraordinary. It's inspiring just to have dinner, lunches, meetings uh, in all shapes and sizes and forms. It's simply wonderful to be here. My project is um, centered around um, stone making. And those, as you probably know, are improvised forms done on the spot popular, often funny, body, insulting, and they are often um, involve another poet who gives a respondent's stanza, so they can end up being wars, poetic wars, a rap, or a poetry slam in today's term. So I thought I would do a project typically for verse, and make extraordinary stuff. In other words, um, crumpled, distorted, disturbed stone. And um, first I had an idea to use Katuba's and other poems. And then I thought, no, 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 no. Kabuchi would have that. This never one does. Go to the kitchen, see what they're saying, and I hope I get some paro bache. And um, the street, the market, the bars, the cafes. So that would be my lyrics. The original piece was to be written for myself and my cello. And um, I decided to open that up and include another soprano. But I think that is absolutely extraordinary in a small ensemble. So that will be kind of the second expanded version. But I want to show you what I do. I have a, a little. And 
us to the end of tonight's presentations. Magical group, what can I say? I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Incredible variety. Really excited to have five more weeks with you all. So thank you everyone for coming. Have a good night.